W-O-V-U-L-P, Cleveland. This is Open Door with Vince Robinson. In-depth conversations with people who are making a difference in the lives of others here and around the world. Culture is at the heart of who you are. Know your culture, find yourself on Open Door with Vince Robinson. Grand Rising, Cleveland, Ohio, Vince Robinson here with another edition of Open Door with Vince Robinson. I have a guest today who wears many hats. He kind of reminds me of myself because when people describe me, you know, they get confused as to what they should say about what I do. Uh, And he is no exception to that rule because he wears so many hats. His name is Ismail Douglas, not Ishmael, because some folks call him Ishmael. I made that mistake one time and he never let me forget it. So It's indelibly etched in my brain. His name is Ismail without an H. He has been creating and providing innovative programming for youth and families for over 30 years. He's currently employed with the Cleveland Metropolitan School District as the Dean of Engagement at Kenneth W. Clement Boys Leadership Academy. His responsibilities include implementing programs and services which can positively impact student achievement and student wellness. And I saw a Facebook post and I saw what somebody was saying about the man, Mr. Douglas, and how much he did for their son. So that's just one lane. But in addition to that, he's an instructor in martial arts, the discipline of capoeira. And he's also versed in Tai Chi and he's teaching people Tai Chi. So he does that. And then he's also a musician and he's one heck of a guitarist. We did a, a performance at Kent State for the Juneteenth performance and I got it recorded on a CD. It's in my CD changer in my car. And I listen to that. And whenever I'm driving around Cleveland, I'm listening to Ismail Douglas on that guitar tearing it up. So without any further ado, welcome to Open Door, Ismail Douglas. Thank you, Brother Vince. I'm honored to be here. Um, It's a pleasure. And um, it's always an honor to play with you. We've known each other for some years, you know. So we went way back and... uh, you're an awesome musician, uh, composer, poet, and all the world. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'm remembering a date that we had at uh, another level in the Green Light Shopping Center. Oh, yeah. This was back in 1997, and I was just wow. cutting my teeth on that whole idea of being a band leader. I had never been in a band before. Yeah. You know, I was getting my feet wet, learning how to do things, and you were gracious enough to do a performance with us and Kevin Conwell and Derek James. And and I'll never forget that, you know, but I just felt a certain sense of regret because I just wasn't at your level. You know, I'm learning how to do this. So I'm like, hopefully someday we'll play again. And then it happened. And I'm like, I'm so grateful to have grown to a place where I could, I could be on the same stage with you and do the music some justice. So I hope you don't mind me heaping the accolades on you, brother, but you definitely deserve them. Thank you. You know, Vince, we're all evolving, right? Um, where I was at that time, I didn't feel comfortable with my play. Like anything else, you always try to find a way to evolve your, your track. You never want to stay the same. You never want to be like on a treadmill running, but you ain't going nowhere. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So how do you always evolve with your art? So thank you. I'm, I'm humbled by your... Uh, Thank you so much. Yes. So uh, I like to uh, ask our guests about their relationship to the city of Cleveland. The the show at one point was called Open Door Cleveland, but I evolved it, you know, in in the interest of rebranding it because I'm doing a lot of different shows with with Open Door. But I talk to guests who are from Cleveland about their life in Cleveland. So if you could just give us a little bit of background about your life here in Cleveland. Well, I grew up on um, a street called Parkway, which is off the, in the Superior area. Um, I grew up on the same street with um, Baba Don Freeman and uh, his wife, Norma Jean Freeman, who's made a transition. So that was a very important um, experience for me. Uh, and then I noticed one thing I was reflecting on lately is there were a lot of fathers in the house on that street. I would say at least 80% of the house had a male figure in it. 
a man figure, I should say, and or their father lived with them. And as I was growing up, um, I remember going down the street and Don Freeman snatched me up. I was about 15. <laughs> he said, um, I want you to start coming to some meetings at my house. I'm like, why don't you pick me, you know? Um, and then he gave me the book, um, Chancellor Williams, Destruction of Black Civilization to read. And that started my journey um, on this quest of finding out who I am as a black person in America, a person of African descent, um, and the contributions that we made to the world, not just in one area, but the world. And then when I went to Cleveland State, uh, I was honored to meet Barbara Oconta and Professor Curtis Wilson, who also has made his transition. And while I was at Cleveland State, um, we would have these engaging conversations in the culture center. And I met Ivan Van Sertema, um, so many people. Um, it's the, the list is so long, I don't want to forget anybody. But that became a, a more exposure to our history. And, and at that point, I met Paul Hill, Elder Paul Hill, who asked me, and this was in the 80s, and I was a student um, studying history and religion, to work in the schools. I had no experience. I was like, what am I going to do? He said, I want you to work with some young people. And that started my journey of working in the Cleveland Public School System. Yeah. So, you so, know, you know yeah, right. you, you bring that up, and, and I think it, it's really important to highlight the significance of you being a black man in an educational institution that provides support for young folk because black men in, in schools are rare. Yes. Um, you know, most of our children are being taught by European women and this is not to cast dispersions on European women, but there seems to be a lack of positive role models in those schools. Obviously what you're doing there is making a difference. Can you talk to us about the the importance of your role in in that school? I just want to say um, to your point about black men in education. Actually, most uh, black men who go into education go to high schools. Very few. The percentage in, in Cleveland, if black men make a four percent, we're doing good. I'm talking about pre K to eight building. So, and that's where the foundation is built. Uh, so my role there when I was hired was to come in and help change the culture of the building. What was interesting is for me how the ancestors worked. I was doing a workshop on how to work with black boys. The principal at that time told me he had no plans to come to that workshop. He said, well, I'm going to go and see what this guy is talking about. See, so he went in and he was very impressed. When I finished doing my presentation, he immediately said, I want you at my school. So he made it possible for me to come there to be, at that time, it was called the Dean of Culture. And then they, the district changed it to Dean of Engagement. So my thing was, to, uh, was, how do I change the culture? And I told the principal, if we don't change the landscape of our young men thinking, how they think, then we're not making a dent in their life. How do we change that mental landscape? And he said, that's a very tough question to answer. So I always thought about what do I need to bring into the building? Right now we have African drumming. Uh, we're teaching mindfulness. I teach the capoeira. They're doing yoga. On the after school, we have boxing. So there's an, uh, a host of things that we bring into the building as we call life-changing opportunities for our young men. And it's, it's not easy, let me tell you that, um, because our young men have so much that they bring, like we all do as human beings. Um, that they need to really check on how can they change themselves, how can they heal themselves, and at the same time see the value of who they are. Because a lot of the young men are being, they are beat down all the time, and whether it's the media, with the community, and then maybe in some homes, not all, but um, and our, some our, our parents are doing the best that they can do, but they're frustrated as well. So we have to bring this compassion and understanding that they're damaged good like we are, you know? So we have to give them the tools. We have to expose them to activities and programs that can really help address those issues. Could you talk about um, the, the challenge or the challenges that are involved in 
connecting with young folks. Your your title is Dean of Engagement and the things that you've outlined that you are actually engaging them in are uh, way outside of the norm for children in, in a school situation. So can you talk about the challenge that you have in, in terms of engaging with these young folks and getting them to get it? Well, one of the things is like, for example, I use Papa Way, right? And it's like, what is that? You know, <laughs> um, who created that? And I was, my, my attempt is always to make a connection to some of the great things we've done, but it's actually something I can show, you know? Um, so when I brought the Papa Way up, I said, well, y'all play Tekken 3. That was a video game, right? And the guy was saying, Eddie Gordo. He said, yeah, we know Tekken 3. I said, that's a couple letters. So I had to relate to their experiences in order for them to understand. But I also had to understand they have to be patient. And a couple letters in the same for everyone. And I understood that, you know. But I wanted to expose them to something that would be an impact on them. So, for example, I see a young man I had like 20 years ago. They said, Mr. Douglas, you still do a couple letters? They still remember that. Uh, I was walking in Eagle Creek Park, and this um, young man was walking with his two sons. He walked up to me and he said, Mr. Doug, I said, hey, what's happening? He told his son, this is very touching. This man taught me how to be a man. And he has sons now. So again, that exposure, and it's not easy. We have to do the research to find out really what works for our young people. And they really speak their language. It's a different generation. And we have to be able to modify what we do. What I did 20 years ago, I don't do the same way today. It's not, it doesn't work for young people today. But the other elements of the truth will always work. So that's what I try to bring. Well, you know, I'm remembering that scene in that the latest Shaft movie where where John Shaft's son is in a club somewhere and <laughs> somehow he's physically threatened and then he starts whipping out the cap with Atta, you know, mm-hmm. now when you get young people to see something like that, they'll be saying, yeah, I want some of that. So obviously this method of engagement is absolutely working. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is Ismail Douglas. He is a multifaceted person. He's an instructor of Capoeira and Tai Chi. He's the Dean of Engagement at Kenneth W. Clement Boys Leadership Academy. And he's also a fine musician. We're going to talk more to him about his life when we come back. Right here on 95.9 FM, WOVU, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. We'll be right back. We are WOVU 95.9 FM. Our voices united. United to enhance our community. United to be a beacon of hope. United to empower our community. WOVU 95.9. Our voices united. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson and my guest, Ismail Douglas, who just uh, described how in this this chills are going through me man when you said the man walked up to you and said this is the man who taught me how to be a man in front of his son that was i know that was a powerful moment in that boy's life and i know that it was probably a powerful moment in your life because in that moment you realize that what you are doing is making a difference yeah and thank you for uh, again your your gracious comments Uh, i went into people late it's just been amazing I was doing a gig, and this Puerto Rican parent walked up to me and says, Mr. Douglas. And she said, oh, yeah, oh, so, so, yeah. Oh, my son, I want to thank you. He's a grown man. I really want to thank you what you did for my young man, my, my son. And, again, hearing that, again, I say, this is what I'm here to do. I'm here to do the work. But it's really changing their internal design. You know what I mean? The internal design, which they're doing the work. I'm just giving them the opportunities to make it happen and giving them the resources because um, we can't touch every young man or every young lady, but we can touch them in a way that it may not resonate at the time, but later on they'll start to think, oh, I remember Vince telling me that, oh, yeah, now it makes sense because something happened in their life that triggered that experience to come back or that teachable moment. Yeah. Well, somebody named Don Freeman made you aware of a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization. Right. <laughs> and that woke something up in you and it, it impacted you for the rest of your lives. 
life. So, you know, it, it is what the ancestors do and connecting us. Uh, when you were sharing that experience with me, I was just wondering, you know, when you were a young person, what you thought would happen with your life, you know, what were your goals and aspirations versus how things actually played out? What did you want to do as a young Ismael? See, that's interesting. I remember a high school teacher telling me, he said, Douglas, that's an important name. You're going to be somebody, you know? And I, I was like, okay, you know, you know, at that time, um, there was things that were going on in the community that I just didn't gravitate towards. I always was interested in, in being exceptional. Um, so, for example, I'm going to go back to the Freemans. Um, this, one of his sons had a book on yoga. And I didn't see no black people doing no yoga. <laughs> we bought this book, and we started actually doing some of the poses out of the book without a teacher. That was my first exposure to um, yoga again. Uh, so I was thinking, I didn't think about uh, really getting involved in yoga. I definitely didn't know anything about Capoeira, but I did know about the music because in my household, we listened to RB, gospel, jazz, rock. We had an international thing happening, an international festival at our house. And my brother played guitar. It was interesting about him, he can play both right and left hand. Some songs he can play right handed. The other songs he was switching, play left at it. So he exposed me to Jimi Hendrix. Listened to a lot of West Montgomery too. Uh, Ron Kessel, uh, Eric Gale, uh, Grant Green. Uh, and I was exposed to all these great artists. But it was just the music that I got exposed to in my house and my parents was just phenomenal. Uh, my dad, um, like a lot of um, men from the South, he didn't finish school. He left school at the eighth grade and he came up to Cleveland, got a job at the Republic Steel, worked there, but raised his family. My father met my mother when he was 16. I want to say that again. He met my mother at 16. They stayed together until he made his transition at the age of 88. My mother said that was the only man, man she ever knew. And my father showed us how to be responsible, how to be on time, how to take care of business. Um, so to me, those are experiences that are invaluable, um, that left an imprint on all of us. So again, being exposed to the music uh, was just important for me. Okay. And obviously, uh, you had a great role model. And, you know, with that whole transition piece, and this is something that I'm realizing in my own life, you know, somehow dad shows up in what we do and who we are, you know? So a lot of times people look back and they think of somebody having made transition and as if they're no longer relevant, but the way I see it, my father lives through me. Exactly. So I'm able to carry out certain things that he couldn't because of all the things that he was involved in. I remember a couple of times in life hearing my father play the piano. You know, and he wasn't Herbie Hancock, he wasn't George Cables, anybody like that, but he knew how to play a little something. When I was six years old, we had a piano. And they saw that I had some aptitude, I guess. They hooked me up with a teacher, so I started playing. And I wrote my first song at the age of six. Wow. You know, it, it, I don't play it very much. I can still remember the song, and it had a Latin feel to it. Okay. And it and it had a one four five progression to it. Okay. You know, so even at that young age, I was connected somehow. And you know, I mean, some folks they think this is all spooky and everything, the idea that we might have multiple lives or whatever. But you know, your existence, my existence is proof of the fact that there are so many things about ourselves that we don't know that at some point in time we discover about ourselves and we're able to exercise those skills and those talents. And we begin to realize that the gifts that we have are for the benefit of others when we exercise those things to the extent that we do. So you teach Capoeira and Tai Chi. Uh, you're connected with a, a great friend and brother of mine, brother Wayne Chandler. Yes. Who yeah, I hear amazing things about him all the time. Like, 
You know, I was I was in a clubhouse uh, podcast <laughs> with him a couple weeks ago, and he tells a story about being hit by a Ford Explorer and traveling through the air 30 feet and landing on his feet, not injured. And he stands up and everybody's looking at him like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> and he's he, he's like, well, I'm OK. You know, and then they make him lay down. And then he gets back up after doing a self-assessment and realizing that that nothing is broke. I'm intact that, you know, I can just move on with my life. But, you know, just reflecting on that story and and understanding the power that we have as individuals. And then, you know, I see a video of you doing a headstand or you, you, you're you you're on one hand or something. And, and it's like and you, you're doing all these flexible things. And, and I see, brother, you're in great shape. So whatever you're doing is working. And if it's working for you, it could work for other people and enable them to have uh, a, an optimal quality of life. You know, you have to be extremely disciplined. And those things, music is a discipline. Tai Chi is a discipline. Capoeira is a discipline. You have to be extremely disciplined in order to operate on that level. Could you talk about um, how you're wired to be so disciplined and to be able to accomplish the things that you were able to accomplish physically, mentally, and spiritually? Well, let me just go back. When I was younger, um, I was experimenting with all kinds of stuff. I said, I got to change my life. I went on a 40-day fast when I was in high school. No one told me how to do it. Um, I just did it. And from that point, my life started to transform. I started getting exposed to different people. I did a lot of reading, um, practiced my guitar. Uh, when I left high school, I didn't do anything. I practiced my guitar every day. I took a lunch break. <laughs> like I was on a job. Well, it was a job. Um, but I became, and that taught me discipline. And I know that at that time, I started to really understand the power of commitment of your time because that's what you can do. Uh, you have, it's an investment, you know. We invest in everything outside of ourselves. And something always directed me back towards the internal journey. Uh, and it takes time. And a lot of work. This is not something you can just do, get a certificate because you did so many hours. This is your life work. Uh, and that's not to knock anybody getting a uh, certification. So I want to be very clear about that. But even when they get that, you still have to grind. Um, so being disciplined with the, the music taught me a lot of things. And then just spilled over to other aspects of what I was doing. Capoeira. And one thing about Capoeira that I have learned, it, shows you the power that is inside you, how you can take an idea and manifest it into the material world. It comes from an inside. Like the instrument behind you called the bed and bow. There's a connection, the relation between the movements of couple and music, rhythm, right? And that's one of the things that I really try to stress in when I teach the classes. You have to be you. All I'm doing is directing you towards yourself. You can't be like me. You can't move like me. You have your own rhythm. And move to your rhythm, but be very good at it and be very committed at what you do. You know, there's a lot of distractions. Do not let those distractions take you away from your mission. Yes. We're going to talk a little bit more about Capoeira because I'm sure that there are folks in the listening audience who are saying, what's that? You know, they don't know about it being Brazilian and African at the same time and and something that they could actually implement in their own lives if they're interested in defending themselves in certain situations or neutralizing danger. It's, it's definitely a good tool to have in your tool belt. So we'll talk a bit about uh, capoeira and we'll also give the uh, listening audience an understanding of what Tai Chi is because, you know, you got Tai Chi, you got Qigong, you got yoga, you got all these different Eastern modalities and they're all connected in certain ways because breath is the common denominator in all of them. Uh, but we're going to dive a little bit more into that when we come back. 
You are listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU. My guest is Ismail Douglas, the Dean of Engagement for Kenneth W. Clement Boys Leadership Academy, a musician and also an instructor in Capoeira and Tai Chi. We're going to dive more into that when we come back. Are you or someone you know in need of help? Here's a resource you can turn to. The Thea Bowman Center has been serving the community for over 50 years and provides services to help support Mount Pleasant and surrounding communities of all ages. Some of these programs include adult education like GED, computer classes, food pantry, senior outreach, youth after school, and summer programs, and much more. Are you a Cleveland resident in need of a GED preparation, a food pantry, youth or senior programs? Then call the Thea Bowman Center at 216-491-0669 or visit theabowmancenter.org. Call the Thea Bowman Center at 216-491-0669 or visit theabowmancenter.org to register today. This message is brought to you by the Thea Bowman Center and WOVU 95.9 FM, Our Voices United, a Burton Bell Car community radio station. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is Ismail Douglas, Dean of Engagement, Kenneth W. Clement Boys Leadership Academy. He's an instructor in Capoeira and Tai Chi and also a musician. And it is my privilege my honor and my pleasure to have him on the show this this morning you know um i think about folks who would be great for this show and and i saw you a couple weeks ago i think it was when we were down at ken i'm like dang why haven't i talked to ismail yet so um we're able to connect dots and 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 get together right now so we'll we'll continue with this conversation so um you are into Capoeira. Uh, tell the folks out there listening what Capoeira is. So Capoeira is an uh, African Brazilian art form that was brought to Brazil from Angola uh, during the slave era. So we know that there are a lot of martial systems on the continent. A lot of people don't know that um, because they are used to seeing the Asian martial arts. But a lot of the arts that um, we need to learn more about are those arts on the continent that influence some of the Asian martial arts. Um, so there's a lot, a lengthy discussion we can have about that. But in terms of Capoeira, when those enslaved Africans were brought to Brazil, um, they brought the culture. You you can't take the culture out of the people. So when Capoeira came, um, they used it to, to, as liberation, right? Um, some of them, many of them straight from the plantations and went to the mountains. And it sounds what we call the Quilombos. Um, King Zumbi, um, Opamadis, you hear that a lot in Capoeira. These were fortresses that fought against the Dutch and the Portuguese. Eventually, the Portuguese took control of Brazil. So, a lot of the battles were against the Portuguese. And there are um, historical documents that talk about them doing all these amazing moves, right? Um, but also, it's associated with the Angola that comes out of uh, Angola. It's called the zebra dance. And so when it came there, uh, things got modified. Um, but then when it became outlawed, it was associated with criminal behavior. <laughs> Sounds to me, huh? Um, yeah, right. So they outlawed it, right? Um, because it was basically black people doing it. So it was no longer allowed to practice up there. Uh, so in the 20s, late 20s, uh, a man named Master Big Bimba introduced Capoeira, but it was basically for the upper elite of, of Brazil. And so it became acceptable to practice Capoeira. And then after that, a man named uh, Master de Castilla said, oh, but we need to keep the, the, the roots of it of, from Africa. So they have what they call Capoeira Angola. But it's all Capoeira Angola because it comes from Angola. Capoeira is all over the world. When I was in Istanbul, Turkey, now check this out. They have a Capoeira group there. I went to the uh, friend of mine took me over there and it was this European teacher. Mm-hmm. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Denmark. So think about it. Now, our, uh, our form that was outlawed in Brazil is around the world. Uh, Master De, um, De Solo, who Wayne studied with and I studied with as well, has a group in Japan and they respect the art form. Um, so it's, it's 
takes a lot of discipline. I'm not saying it's easy to learn, but it's really finding your rhythm, right? We have an instrument behind me called the Dead and Bow that we use. We have the drum called the Atabaki. Um, we have, um, a, we really call it tambourine, but it's called a pandero. So different instruments that we use. But it's a fighting system. Um, but it's also, the biggest fight is the internal fight. Uh, how do you fight against your own ignorance, your own self-doubt? Uh, those negative elements of yourself, how do you fight against that? So, um, so that well, is a very powerful art form that I really hope that more African Americans can really understand the importance of it and embrace it. I'm not saying you have to practice it, um, but at least expose your children to it, expose yourself to it. Um, because there are a lot of people who don't look like us who do a couple letters. This is the power power in the movement, the power, the spirit of it, they understand it. So um, I'm, that's why I'm very uh, consistent at presenting it to our communities. Because I want us to understand what we've done in the martial arts arena. And that's just one couple. What is just one that, like I say, many art forms on the country. Yeah. So uh, as you're doing this, who do you find gravitating towards uh, practicing capoeira? Is it something that you see a lot of us doing or do you have mixed uh, classes or how does that look? Well, my class is not very big, it's small. Um, and I look at the quality of people who come, you know, <laughs> that's important to me. I want to be able to give something that my ancestors, I feel and know have charged me to do. Um, so my class is mixed. But most of my, my adult classes on Thursdays, it's mostly adults. I have some children. I used to teach at Rainy, which is all children. That's the best time to really start teaching Capoeira because a lot of people feel uncomfortable being upside down, and I understand that. But I learned Capoeira in my 30s, late, late 30s, and that's very unusual. Usually in Brazil, they start at four and five, uh, very young. But I wanted to learn the art form. Again, that's what I learned at Cleveland State through another person talking about the African martial arts, which I knew nothing about. Mm-hmm. So um, it's women and men. Okay. And one time it was mostly men doing it. Now you see the integration of women as well. And they are yeah. whew, awesome. Right. Is, it, uh, is it extremely physically demanding? You work muscles you didn't even know you had in your body. <laughs> when people think about the way to we have people come from other martial arts. I remember one time Wayne was teaching class. And some guys came from another our martial system. And they took the first class, they never came back. But in the class, they were saying, wow, they were using muscles that they had never used before. Uh, so again, a couple of it teaches you that you turn the disadvantage into an advantage. You learn the aspect of power of mind, body, and spirit. Because when you do come with it, you, you actually you have a conversation you play against another person. So it's strategic like chess. So you can learn some basic good cardiovascular um, movement, you know, even if you don't do all the flipping, walking on your hands, but at least the move, basic movements are very good. Anybody can do that. There's a, a gentleman who I met from Brazil, he's a master, he's living in New York now. Probably in his 80s, I have a picture of him. In the 70s, he's doing cartwheels. <laughs> you know, so they say he found the fountain of youth. So the mm-hmm. very powerful spiritual system, and at least that's how I have come to understand it. Yeah. Anybody can do couple what again. The basic stuff you can do, some of the other stuff, depending on your age, you might want to like, I don't want to do that right now. <laughs> yeah. Now, Capoeira is a distinct contrast with Tai Chi. Tai Chi, the movements are a lot slower. There's a, there's a certain fluidity that comes with it. You know, I, I took about, I would say maybe three or four lessons of Tai Chi back in the 90s. Yeah. And I remember showing up and the movements were really slow and controlled. And, and I'm not one who sweats easily. And okay. I can feel the sweat rolling down my back. And I'm like, hey, what's going on here? Why Why is this happening? Could you talk about the differences between the, the two uh, modalities and, and how even the slow fluid movements can benefit you as well? Well, there's a the art form of Capoeira Angola. The movements are much slower um, than what they call a uh, or regional, which came later. But Angola, the movements are done very slow to kind of discipline the body, 
to move into a handstand very slow. So um, I see them all connected Tai Chi because it's dealing with energy, right? A couple of it is energy. And moving slow allows the body to become very disciplined. I always, you know, tell all the students, you can, you can do something fast and develop bad habits and it's sloppy. Do something slow and take your time. So when you do it fast, it's precise. It's with for precision. But you have to train the body to relax, breathe correctly. So every movement is associated with breathing. It's the same with capoeira, you know. Um, to me, it's dealing with the energy of who you are and how do you express and manifest that energy on the physical plane. So um, I do the Wu style of Tai Chi, the different forms of Tai Chi. Um, and I learned from a Master Wong who had a shop, a small shop on Coventry. And I remember him going into this drawer and he said, come on, I want to show you something. He pulled out this picture of an uh, old uh, monk and a handstand on his two fingers. Mm. I looked up and said, <laughs> and it wasn't trick photography, right? He said this monk had learned to pour all his cheese into those two fingers. And you can see a couple of uh, those um, pictures on the internet right now. But that takes years of practice, a lot of meditation, I really understand the dynamics of your body. But it's all connected to nature, right? It's a couple of the movements are connected to nature. Tai Chi is mimicking nature, right? Flowing like water. So we have in Tai Chi movements uh, named after animals, like makaku, you know? So in Tai Chi, you have snake creeps down. So they're all connected to nature, and we are nature. So that's how I've come to understand it. Yeah, I would have to say that what you just explained probably explains how Wayne could get hit by that truck. And because he had such command of his body and he was so connected with his chi, he didn't get hurt. And then his body awareness for him to be able to do that scan, you know, yeah. he, he he described a moment in which he felt like he was outside of his body mm. as this was happening. You know, I mean, think about it. You get hit. It probably takes all of two yeah. seconds for that to happen. But as you're flying through the air and all these scenery is throwing through your brain and, 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 and you're having that, that, that ethereal moment, all these things come together in a split right. second that, that lasts like 20 seconds in somebody's brain. That's really right. amazing. And, you know, we know about uh, dimensional shifts, you know, that's real, right? And certain practices give you access to that, right? Um, so with Wayne, he's, He's just amazing, you know. I was blessed to meet him. It's interesting how I met him. I met him at a meeting with, I don't know if you know Baba Kalindi. He's, he's transitioned. He was an expert in African martial arts. They uh, all were, were invited to my house. I didn't even know Wayne. And um, I was at a lecture uh, with him prior to that. And they all came to my house. Uh, and we had a conversation. I mentioned Capoeira. He said, oh, you want to learn Capoeira? I said, yes. I said, I've been like reading about it doing some of the movements along, he said, I'll teach you. And then I started studying with him. And then I got introduced to his master, Master De Sola, who's phenomenal. So we, you know, stuff he just does is just incredible. Yeah. But it's the mental approach to the art form that really intrigues me. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. more than just simple movement. It was the, the mental strategic aspect of the movement that you incorporate into what you do. Yes, yeah. Well, you know, that's another level of, of really think to me. That's another level. Yeah. The first comedic principle is the universe is mental and it ties into everything that you just said. We're going to dive into a little bit more of that when we return. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU. My guest is Ismail Douglas. And he is the Dean of Engagement at Kenneth W. Clement Boys Leadership Academy. He's an instructor in Capoeira and Tai Chi, and he's also a fantastic musician. We'll rejoin the conversation when we get back right here on 95.9 FM WOVU. Cleveland, we know you have something to say. We know there are things on your mind you've been itching to get out. Call the WOVU Talkback Line. 
216-200-7848 and tell us what it's all about. Tell us what's bothering you. Tell us what makes you happy. Tell us what you want to hear on WOVU. Call or text the WOVU Talkback line, 216-200-7848. This is WOVU, our voices united. We can't do what we do without you. WOVU LP Cleveland. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson right here on 95.9 FM WOVU. My guest this morning is Ismail Douglas, the Dean of Engagement at Kenneth W. Clement Boys Leadership Academy. He's also an instructor in Capoeira and Tai Chi. And as I said before, an amazing musician. You know, you said you grew up listening to Wes Montgomery. And that guitar that you were playing on that cut is like, yeah, he's channeling West right now. <laughs> you know, can I just say this? Can I just say this? Since you mentioned West, I was playing in the club, and a friend of mine, she really can tell it. I mean, it, it just sends chills through your body. And I sat in, and we were playing. And I was, I don't know, she said my eyes literally went in the top of my head. She said, you zoned out. And at that time, she said, the man said, here's West. West on the wall. Look at West in the house. West is playing. She said, my whole persona had transformed. And she said, the environment was transformed. She said, I don't know what happened to you, but when your eyes went to the top of your head, you get transported somewhere else. And that's when that man said, there's West on the wall. Yeah. I had a similar experience. It was the very first gig that we did with Timbata. Okay. It, it was at the Callaloo over at 156 <laughs> and, 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 uh, what is it? Lakeshore? Yeah. Waterloo. 156 yeah, Waterloo. 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 Right. yeah Waterloo. And I have the video. So I, I have a, a visual record of what happened, but we were playing footprints that night. Okay. And it was like something just entered me. And my hands did something that they had never done before, you know, and it was like I was possessed or something. And and I reflect on that just to solidify the idea that we do receive visits, you know, and we do channel and we are conduits. You know, I I separate my myself from this egotistical notion that, you know, somehow I just. I just do all these things because it's all me. It's all me. It's all me. No, it's not. not. You know, it is the blessing of being able to be that thing that things pass through, you know, just just as you, you know, sometimes when you're standing in front of them young boys and something is feeding your consciousness and you express what you express to them, you know, sometimes we have to separate ourselves from that part of ourselves that's so tied to the ego and ego is not a bad thing. It can be good and it can be bad, but you know, I don't accept uh, credit for what happens as a result of what I do. Yeah, I, give, I give all of that to the ancestors. I give it to the creator. You know, I'm not so, so big headed that I think, Oh, that's all Vince. Cause it's not. And I guess, again, my family didn't expose me to my, my parents didn't expose me to a couple of letters. You know, that came, that was an ancestral hookup, you know. Uh, I'm going to give you another example. I'm studying this instrument called the Kora. It's 21 strings. It's from West Africa. And uh, it's a very interesting instrument to hear. It's very mystical and magical. But I'm going to give you um, the history behind that. We received two memberships um, to the art museum. I didn't pay for them. I don't know where they came from, but they came in the mail. So then that was I was telling my wife, I said, let's go see um, the San Nupu uh, art exhibit. And the person that was there was an, a core master, right? I didn't know him. And I told him I have a core at home, I don't know how to play it, but I would like to learn how to. He said, I'll teach you. To make a long story short, he ended up marrying somebody from Cleveland. I called him one day because my string broke. He said, I'm in Cleveland. I said, I want to start taking my lessons. He said, oh, right. Started right today. He comes from a long line of core players. They know go back hundreds of years. But what's interesting 
is that I never paid for those membership cards. Somebody sent them to me. And then I went to the art museum because I could get in the um, exhibit with those membership cards. I didn't have to pay. It's already, the design was already hooked up for me and I had to take advantage of it. Yeah. And I keep those membership cards in my wallet as a reminder <laughs> how I learned or started the road to learning the card. Yeah. You, what you just shared with us reminds me of the concert that we witnessed with Kenge Kenge. Oh, oh that was, oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah. And they were talking about the fact that playing these instruments meant that the ancestors were coming into the room and that the ancestors were actually playing. Mm -hmm. Is that what you took from what he said? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's channeling that energy, right? Yeah. People in the church, you know, they say they get filled, right? Come on now. You know what I'm saying? Something is coming through us, you know? But we've been taught to, oh, that's, oh, no, 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 that's empowering. And that's respecting that energy, right? And as long as you're doing it something that's um, right for people, you know? And I'm not saying people don't take it and use it the wrong way, but them brothers, they were real. That was healing music, you know? Yes. They came with it in a really sincere and authentic way. Yes. Yeah, and you know, what's really interesting is that they're singing... Swahili and we can't understand a word they're saying but still the music is moving us in such a way that it does facilitate healing in our bodies Yes, and I'm going to give you an example I've been through Istanbul a number of times right? the first time I went um, we were going to a school for the hearing impaired hear this man, the hearing impaired right? so we go up the stairs there were three African Americans in the group there was a brother who walked in before me. I walked in behind him. As soon as I walked in, one of the young men started saying, mm -hmm, pointing to me, right? Um, because he's hearing impaired. And I was asking the translator, well, what was he saying? He said, he wanted to know what you were break this. I'm like, no, why do capoeira? So this young man did a break dance move that was unbelievable. He stood up and did this. Saying, pointing to me, now it's your time. <laughs> but I did a move. And we're going back and forth. And I said, you know what? Well, we're going to be here all day. And I said, I'm going to do a move that I got I to gotta, I gotta kind of set this down. So I'm going to a handstand. And I have a picture of this. I take one hand off the floor, put my hand on my head, and tilt my body over. And I'm on one hand. They're looking like, wow. They go tell their friends. Now, they're going into school telling people, oh, this guy is here. Every class where I'm going, they ask me to do something, right? But what's really interesting. When I get downstairs, the head of schools offered me a job. He said, if you want to work here in Istanbul, I will make the rent today for you. He said, because they picked up something about you. This is hearing and here, so other faculties are stronger. That humbled me, right? And lets me know that they were reading my energy. But it was something that I brought into the room. And then that's the first brother. Nothing that he wasn't, you know, they didn't want to talk to him, but he that young man said something about it. And to me, that let me know this thing about energy is real. I didn't really need that particular skill. It just basically supported my idea that it's, it can happen. And for them to offer, I just couldn't take the job. And then every time I would go back, they would ask me to do stuff with them, perform my guitar with the kids. But it was more about me working with the kids. Because children are still close to that understanding, you know, they're not as polluted as adults, so I'm not saying polluted in another sense, but bombarded with so much mess, you know? Mm -hmm. So, Ismail, um, and, and I don't want to gloss over the fact that you spent time in Turkey, because, you know, 99.9% .9 of us don't even know where Turkey is. <laughs> but, um... But they have a population in Turkey. And okay. But, uh, she didn't know what to talk about. But I, okay. know, I wanted to take me to them, but we didn't have time. Okay. I just wanted to I, say that. Okay. And thank you for that. Um, what I'm thinking about right now is just how you vibrate. I notice about you having known you for as long as I have. And I, I see you as a very positive person. 
You know, I know that you're vibrating on a high frequency. And I know that because of the discipline that you have, the fact that you are so closely connected to your breath, your awareness of chakra systems and all those kinds of things. You know, there's something about you that enables you to be in those situations and someone can look at you, mm. not know you, but look at you and know that there's something special about you. Where do you think that comes from? That's a good question. You know, that's, that's something that I'm still trying to find out, to be honest with you. I don't know if I have an answer for that. Um, but I know it's the spirit, you know, and the ancestral elements that's working through me. That's causing me to do these things, you know, that's really inspiring me to do it. Uh, it's very complex. One of the things that I come to understand is that this thing of discipline is real. This commitment is real. And when you're ready, this when a student is ready to teach you to appear, and that could be the universe, right? You're ready to receive, and they, those energies are seen, those forces are seen that you're committed to something. They get together to make sure they set up scenarios or situations for it to happen. You meet certain people that you would never think you would meet. I never thought I'd make meet Wayne Chandler, you know? Or even going back to what Don Freeman with discussion about civilization, Chancellor Williams book. Me and Paul Hill just happened to be in a culture center, asked me to take something. Those things were being set up for me. I just took advantage of it. It's not, I'm not saying it was easy. You know, some days I get up, I don't want to work out, but I have to remind myself of my mission. I have to do it. You know? I'm not going to be here for that, at least physically. You know? So I have to take opportunities as they come. And so that's a very tough question, you know. Um, so I don't want to say that I have an answer for it. I have an understanding how these things are functioning. And maybe if you're asking that question probably next year or next week, maybe I have a better answer. But again, it's a very difficult question. Because we're well, always I, on the journey, right? Always on the journey. Yeah. I think you partly answered it when you said that when you were in high school, every break that you got, you were practicing your guitar. You were wired that way. And then you took that same dedication to your instrument and you infused it to the other disciplines that you acquired, i.e. Tai Chi, i.e. Capoeira, you know, uh, probably practice yoga or something like that, or at least have an awareness of it. Um, you know, those are very great things to look back upon you know, and to, to understand about who you are and why, you know, so I would just say that, you know, whatever you're doing is working, you know, if you could put it in a can or a bottle or put it in a package somehow it would be great if you could sell it because our people need it. Uh, we have just a couple minutes. If you would uh, just let us know how folks can connect with you and what kinds of things that you're offering in terms of instruction right now. Uh, yes, you can find me on Facebook, Ishmael Douglas. Um, you also can find me on Instagram, Divine underscore Secret um, on Instagram. Um, I teach classes on Mondays. It's a Tai Chi class at Euclid Creek Park, and it's called the Cory Picnic Area. That's from 6.30 to 8. And then on Thursdays, I teach the Capoeira, which is in uh, the Kelly Picnic Area from 6.30 to 8. So uh, Euclid Creek Park is very magical and people, when they come take the class, they feel they can hear the water connect to nature. So uh, those are the ways that you can best reach them in terms of okay. uh, social media. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a great benefit to being outside and, and being able to connect with nature on that level. You know, when you get to a certain level of understanding, you understand how closely you relate to nature. You are part of nature, you know, yes. metu nature. You know, this, this kind of got past me, but as we were talking, I was just remembering the images on the, uh, the, the place in Beni Hassan, Egypt, also known as Kemet, where they had those images of brothers practicing martial arts back then. You know, uh, everything that they do in China, everything that they do in India, everything that they get credit for, you will find roots for that in Africa. Capoeira is the uh, stark evidence of that. Uh, yeah. Brother Ismail, it has been a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Uh, we'll have to thank check you. back in with you and, and see how things are going at some future point in time. But thanks for joining me on Open Door. 
Thank you, Brother Vince. It's an honor. Um, keep up the great work that you're doing. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Until you, then, brother. know yourself, love yourself, be yourself, make today your best day. Peace. Peace.